Hi, welcome. So he gave me a really brief introduction, which was awesome. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, I do have 10 years in higher education with the University of Washington Tacoma. I've worked about five years as a business consultant and um, one of those years with Espionage Cosmetics, which is a local nerdy makeup company. Uh, started Revision Fiber or Revisioned in Urban Boutique uh, in July, so a new place just down the street um, on St. Helens. And uh, the reason why I keep flipping and saying Revision Fibers and why our social media is Revision Fibers, because in 2009, I started a company called Revision Fibers in the midst of doing all of the other things that I was doing. And it was a segue from uh, about 30 years, well, at that point, about 20-ish years in costuming and uh, clothing design. And my big focus is how do we use, reuse the materials that we have, right? Because the fiber industry, the textile industry produces a lot of waste. And instead of having it go into the landfill, there's other options. And some of those options are reclaiming things, reusing them, finding new uses. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I don't want, like you said, we don't want this to be a lecture, but I'm gonna lecture you for about two minutes and then we'll go on to fun stuff. Background, Background information. I'm just providing you with context. So waste and recycling, the average person produces five, four and a half pounds of trash every day. 55 billion aluminum cans are landfilled. Uh, and I'll, if you can read this, because uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna read it to you. Um, we throw away 25 million plastic bottles every hour and the amount of wood and paper we throw away each year is enough to heat 50 million homes for 20 years. Wow. That's a lot of stuff that we're just discarding. But what can we do with that? Well, there's a big resurgence in the DIY community. Do it yourself, right? How do we learn new skills? Some skills that have sort of fallen out of favor, right? We industrialized, we started getting big box stores, they produced things really cheaply in other countries, shipped it here and charge us large amounts of money for not very quality products. I'm not saying not all of them are quality products, but some of them are not. They fall apart, they rip seams, what do we do with it? We throw it away, because it doesn't serve us anymore, right? So one of the things with the resurgence of the DIY community is sort of a focus on reuse, learning new skills, or skills that we used to have that we don't teach anymore. Embracing a notion of self-reliance and cooperation. We don't have it and we can't make it. Is there somebody we know who can? We build relationships and friendships and communities surrounding that. Um, it's a, an understanding that we need to do more with what we have. People keep saying the economy is really bad. What do we do? If our income goes down or we lose an income in the household, we have to make do with what we have. How do we do that? We also wanna talk about reducing our impact, refusing to buy new. Why buy new if you can make it? Barter for it, um, find it. There's some really cool groups uh, and it's, I have a, a local resources and I forgot to put it on there, but um, look up Buy Nothing Project. It's local, well, it's a national uh, project but it's based on communities. So within a specific geographic footprint, you can partner with your neighbors and people who are 
clearing out their garage or their basement or their attic. There's things that they don't need anymore, and what are they gonna do with it? Aside from throwing it out, taking it to the dump, you can gift it to your neighbors, somebody else who has a use for that new thing, or new to them, right? How does this apply to you? It forces you to be a little creative, whether it's actually being creative or finding creative ways to partner in your community or build a network like the Buy Nothing Project where you get to swap items with your neighbors. Challenge yourself to revision what you have in your home or what's gifted to you. Doesn't really, it may be a Christmas gift not exactly perfect, but you don't want to throw it away. You can re-gift it. That's a, a great option. But what about making it useful? Doesn't quite fit. Well, maybe it could be something else. A skirt, a pillow. Um, you know, these are, this is the sort of gist of the whole thing is how do you, how do you get creative with what you have? You don't have to it doesn't have to be a huge impact. It doesn't have to, you don't have to revision your entire life right this second, right? You don't have to go home and start looking at everything and going, okay, what can I gift um, or revision and I wanna build a couch out of nothing? You don't have to do that, okay? Um, it can be really simple, simple things. And I'm actually uh, gonna show you in just a little bit how to do something really simple. Take advantage of local resources, and I'll share a few more of those with you aside from the Buy Nothing Project. There are local resources that will teach you some of those forgotten skills, right? There are local resources that will connect you with your neighbors so you can barter or trade, um, gift. There's also local charities. You can't use it, give it to a charity who can. It'll encourage you to try something new because necessity is the mother of invention, right? Well, the bank account's a little low, you need a gift to go to a party or a birthday party. What do you have in your home that you can actually reuse, create something new that the person you're giving it to will appreciate? Work with your friends and meet new people because we like building relationships. Most people like building relationships. I'll give that caveat. Um, so how do, we, how do we do that? What are some of the local resources that we have? Well, there we go. <laughs> Apparently I hit two buttons at once. Okay, Tinkertopia, if you have not been there, you should go just for the pure joy of seeing an entire um, sweet, filled with things that are full uh, or that are reused, reclaimed. People donate stuff to them all the time. There's, um, I'm really particularly interested in their bin of buttons because they have like five gallons of them. Um, but they also teach classes and they have a um, tinker space. So you can, for a very small fee, um, hang out there and take advantage of the resources that are there, the, the amazing people that work there and the ones who stop in to learn how to build something new. Earthwise Architectural Salvage. There's one up in Seattle. There's also one um, that opened fairly recently in Tacoma that's uh, reclaimed materials, building materials. So have you seen pictures of um, like a greenhouse made out of reclaimed uh, window frames. Hey, this is the place that you want to go. <laughs> uh, not only will they help you, um, but you'll find the resources that you need there to, to do that. It's a great way um, to, to reuse materials that otherwise would have ended up in a landfill. The Restore is another one. Uh, materials that weren't used on a job um, get given to them. It's also uh, run by Habitat for Humanity. They do use some of their resources to build the houses 
that they're gifting to people. Fab Lab, Fab Lab also, great resource. If there is something, you've, you've moved on from little things in your home uh, and you need resources that you don't have, say like welding uh, or a 3D printer, the Fab Lab is a great place to go. Um, they actually create a space that provides you access to all of those things. They'll help get you trained. Um, they do have a membership, uh, and then you get sort of free reign of their stuff um, and their resources and the knowledge of the people who are there. So that is an absolutely fantastic place to go. Uh, and then, of course, there are a myriad of web resources that can uh, stimulate your creative ideas. Who doesn't know about Pinterest? Who hasn't created a board of, like, pallet furniture that you'd love to build? <laughs> okay. um, but there's, there's other things on there as well, ideas to get you started. And a lot of those are linked to blogs about how to do exactly what you want to do or give you a jumping off point for creating that interesting idea. You get to tweak it a little bit, make it your own, and do something interesting. Ah, that's the end of the slideshow, so that's all I have. I'm gonna go back to the local resources in case. There we go. Um, so uh, part of the event is also to give you an idea of things that are quick and easy that you could do at your home, right? Something that you can reuse. I'm gonna show you a few items that we have at Revision Fibers, or Revision and Urban Boutique. It's not necessarily a plug for a store, but if you felt like you wanted to show up, that'd be great. Anyways, <laughs> um, so sweaters. Sweaters that end up with holes, right? Um, or are stretched out. What do you do with them? Well, what about making a little clutch? You wash it, felt it, put a button on it, trim it down, stitch it up. You have a sewing machine, right? Um, I know some people don't sew at all, uh, but a needle and thread will do an, amaz an amazing amount of stuff, and you don't have to be an expert, right? You thread the needle, and you just start stitching, and you learn as you go. Um, one of our vendors who is amazing, I love her work because she is really creative about what she does. Tote bag, right? Seems pretty standard, you can find them anywhere, but this is crocheted out of plastic bags with pop tabs. She has a couple of knitter friends who have the ends of uh, projects, strips, just short strips of yarn, and then bamboo that she finds on the side of the road. Completely reclaimed, okay? This one, same thing, plastic bags and strips of t-shirts. And again, yarn that she got from a friend who was done with a project. Instead of throwing that yarn away or holding on to it for who knows how long until you figure out a project, they gift it to her and she reuses it. What about something bigger? What about this? Who knows what this is made out of? Take a guess. It's a tablecloth. And it's reversible. Okay? So was it, it was a tablecloth found at Goodwill right, gets revisioned into something new. Somebody didn't want it, had a stain in one corner, gets cut out. When you cut out the pattern, you add some ribbon, uh, which probably also came from Goodwill uh, or was gifted, I can't remember which one because I actually made that one. Um, but, uh, oh, and then one of my favorites, journal, okay? So down in the Tide Flats, there's a leather working place. Um, they sell bags of scraps 
And this particular vendor buys those scraps and makes journals. Works with a collective in India to, for the homemade paper um, and then binds them here. And then once the scraps, because this produces scraps, he also uses that last bit of scrap for keychain. So he's making the best use of the materials that are available to him, right? He could buy just bolts of leather, but the goal is to be sustainable. And this otherwise would potentially end up in a landfill, right? If you can't sell it, it gets thrown away. So these are, I'm going to show you a few things that I did today. Um, that are really quick and easy, and use things that you may or may not have in your home. Chances are you have something in your home that will work. How many of you have these? I'd be surprised if any of you did not produce these at some point, okay? Toilet paper rolls. What do we do with these? We either throw them away or we recycle them, right? Because what do you do with a toilet paper roll if you don't have kids in kindergarten? It's a fair question. Ah, so you do reclaim. Excellent. So there's, you can cut them in half or a quarter, slice them down the middle, wrap around cords that keep them organized, right? It's one of the quickest, easiest ways. You can cut them in quarters, tape them or glue them together, um, hang them off a hanger, and you have scarf organizers, right? Run your scarf through it. They're really durable, right? Unless they get wet. Chances are your closet is not going to leak, let's hope, okay? But what else can you do? Well, this is one of the things that I made today. Super cute, fun for little people or younger people or outlandish people. I fall in the last category. You tie them, right? And then you have just little arm cuffs. This little, and you guys can come up and look at them closer, um, is a uh, earring from a, from a set that I found at Goodwill for like $1.99. I think it was on a sale day, so it was even cheaper. Extra lace bits that I had, um, which were gifted to me, and fabric from, pull this out, uh, a dress that a friend of mine did not want anymore. So I would never wear this. Uh, but it does have some use. There's a number of things that could be done with it, right? Um, I'm actually, I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna take the zipper out because I can reuse that. Um, but I also cut out strips and produced this. I probably would never wear this either because it's pink and I clearly, um, I run to darker colors, but, uh, but this is, this is just a cute little thing, right? It's, you know somebody who would go, oh my God, that's so adorable, and would wear it. And it's made out of maybe 50 cents worth of materials, a little bit of glue, um, you use a binder clip, which you can reuse, and uh, an earring, which I popped the little stem off of and glued together, right? What about gift cards? Gift cards are popular during the holidays, right? Um, it's easier than buying something that you don't know if they'll like. Well, what about a little pillow, what they call a pillow box, okay? It's a full-size tube, just like this, right? Flattened, scored to create the little bendy pit bits. Works way better with paper. So those gift bags that you were given that you're saving because you don't want to throw them away, 
but you don't know what to do with them, this is a great idea. Scraps of paper, uh, newspaper, um, books that half-priced books won't buy, encyclopedias, right? Interesting things to do with them. You can create wrapping paper, but you can also cover them in this. I did actually fabric and then a strip of um, ribbon. Same with this one. Did the same thing. Whiter ribbon, little strips of ribbon, and a little jewel that fell out of some random piece of jewelry, kids' jewelry that I had. Oops. And they're super durable. <laughs> but they also fit uh, jewelry. You know, these are things that are really quick and easy to do at home doesn't take a lot of creativity, and there are things in your house that you can use already, right? Um, I made this a little bit long, because I didn't cut it down, uh, and I didn't have time to decorate it, but I also made this, okay? How many people have sunglasses? And I'm, by the way, completely blind at this point, but uh, sunglasses, right, or reading glasses. Um, these are things that are really quick and easy to do. Uh, you cut one tube in half, split it down the center, tape it together, and then you glue on fabric, right? And then glue it together, binder clip it, let it sit for a little bit, and then you decorate it. Something really quick and easy goes in your purse, and you're not spending, what, seven, 10, 20, depending on how fancy you get, Right? You can get uh, a little batch of rhinestones, probably from Goodwill, for practically nothing, and a little epoxy or tacky glue, and you can bejewel it yourself and still have something super fancy. Right? Um, so, and actually, I have enough stuff, so if you guys want to play and try and create, we can totally do that. I also have just directions. This is something that you think you might be interested in trying at home or giving, handing out to somebody else who's maybe crafty and wants to take care, uh, try it. We have handouts that you can take with you. Um, so, uh, I ran through that really quick, um, but I figure, you know, why don't we just go straight into having a little bit of uh, conversation and if you want to come up and play and touch with stuff, touch stuff, um, by all means, let me know. Thank you. Uh, I, I, you know what, I don't, but uh, what I will do is make sure that Gwen has a PDF of that particular slide and I'll add the Buy Nothing group or project to it. Um, that they can maybe post on their Facebook page and social media. Okay, great, thanks. Other questions or? Uh, I always, uh, I always uh, ask the question because we're very kind of forward thinking, future thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward five years, 10 years, 25 years out. I mean, if you're talking about uh, 25 million Well, I think, I think people are already doing exactly this in countries that have less resources than we do. So you can see all sorts of articles about um, houses made out of glass bottles or boats made out of plastic bottles that have been sealed and tied together, right? Uh, and all sorts of little projects trying to do their best to kind of reclaim some of the resources that we're producing at phenomenal rates that are going into landfills or making attempts at recycling and finding that that's not working. Well, our, our country may be <laughs> 
considered at the top of the food chain, but we're finding that you know we're as limited in, in access to resources, at least for the majority of the population. How do you make the best use of what's available to you? And I actually had a wonderful conversation with one woman who was talking about um, teaching people how to to reuse what they had in their community. I mean, look at the, the is it called the Garbage Orchestra? Um, you haven't heard about it. Garbage Orchestra, I, I cannot remember which country it's from, but uh, these are all children who are basically living in uh, garbage heaps with their families. Um, they're living in you know, shanty towns that are surrounded by trash, and the elders in their community really, and it was spearheaded by one gentleman who used to be a music teacher, uh, started creating instruments made out of trash. And these children were taught how to play music on trash instruments. They actually tour around the world now, and it is spectacular. Uh, and these are children who um, have, have never seen wealth or substance. You know, most of them are, you know, pretty malnourished. And they're going to countries where it seems like heaven. You know, streets are paved in gold. And I, I've actually, I've traveled in China where I had conversations with um, students who who thought, because they had been told that uh, streets in America are paved in gold, everybody has two cars. No, really, they believe that, because that's what they were told, and and our streets are paved in gold, except that we have millions of children who don't eat every day, um, and people who are living on the streets, and a homeless population that's growing. Our streets are not paved in gold. So how, how do we, I mean, one of the things that we need to think about is, does this, does this really matter? Does reclaiming and, and making a, a little gift thing like this really matter? Well, what if you were producing some of your own items and you're splitting your, what you're saving between actually putting money in savings and contributing to organizations that are feeding the homeless um, or the underemployed. Um, you know, we, we have the opportunity to make choices that actually improve everybody's lives, not just ours. It's across the board. So 25 years down the road, I really hope to see more people doing things like this, getting back to, you know, uh, taking a tablecloth that doesn't work anymore um, and making something that's useful and spending that money, the $25 that you would have gone out and bought a new tablecloth to buy food for somebody in your neighborhood who doesn't have it. I mean, if, if every single person did that once a month, can you imagine the kind of impact that that can have? And that's just from making one small choice. That's learning a skill, right, that you pass down. Um, I have two children. Both of them are adults at this point. Um, and both of them know how to cook, like really cook, not just like warm up water, right, or nuke. <laughs> A, a lean cuisine, right? They can cook a meal from scratch. Um, my daughter's taken over like making pies for the holidays. You know, my son makes cakes and cookies and they cook at least three times a week where I, do, I don't have to. That's awesome at this stage, right? Um, but they also both know how to sew. My son also has a forge in the backyard and is learning metalsmithing. He also does chain mail. My daughter 
sews and does um, a wide variety of things, but creates dolls, right? Made out of reclaimed t-shirts. Because I think it actually does matter that they learn skills that aren't just about getting a high paying job, but that are practical everyday things that they should know. Because I'm not always gonna be there to cook their meals. That's, that's a great idea. How did I get to my philosophy? Well, um, I had an interesting upbringing. Let's start there. And I'm not going to go into all of it, but let's just say my mother was a hippie uh, who became not a hippie and then went back to being a hippie. Um, I lived on a farm for most of my life, uh, and you know, there is nothing like learning how to shear a sheep, cart the wool, spin the wool, loom the wool into something, right? She also taught me how to sew, and yes, I did have Barbie dolls, but I made their clothes. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I kept moving forward. I got an education. I have a degree in Chinese studies with a, a minor in sociology. Um, that's not where I ended up. I thought I'd be a translator someday. <coughs> thought I'd be a translator someday. I ended up working at uh, the University of Washington, Tacoma. Um, started with their public relations office moved to the Milgard School of Business. None of this seemed like it was gonna be my life. Transferred from there to the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, filled with people more like me, I think. Um, and one of the reasons why I started the store wasn't just about getting back to what I knew I was good at, which was making stuff and being creative but also providing a venue for people who were creative and didn't know how to get their stuff out there, aside from being at craft fairs, right? This is an opportunity to change lives, 30 lives, because we have, well, more than 30 lives, but we have 30 vendors, 30 vendors who have families, who have communities that they interact with outside of me and the store and my family, right? Um, and providing them a venue that gives back a little bit, but also connects them with their neighbors. I mean, a lot of our events, uh, like Small Business Saturday, we had some of our vendors in the store so the people who are coming in to shop actually get to meet the people who are making the things that they buy because we're so disconnected. When you go to Target or Walmart, you know, the big, mm, uh, or, or Nordstrom's even, I mean, you don't know the people, you may know the names, Calvin Klein, like he's always in the news, right? Tommy Hilfiger. They're big names in fashion, but do you know them? Can you, can you walk up and shake their hand? Do you know anything about their lives? Do you know that you know, they are married and they have a grown son who's doing his own, own thing, right? You don't know that. And yes, a lot of selling is about making the product approachable to the person who is buying it. But I think people want relationships. They want to build relationships with their community. We're disconnected from that. Um, and this is a way of doing that, connecting with the people who are around you and asking questions like, how'd you get started in this, right? One of my vendors is a wood turner, does gorgeous work. And I've started doing uh, a series where I go in and interview my vendors and take pictures of what they're doing, right? Um, I didn't know much about him, except that he did beautiful woodwork, right? And he worked with his daughter. 
But I went to his studio and I found out he spent 22 year, years in the military, did, retired from the military, started doing uh, computer repair, which he did for 10 or 15 years, um, and then took a random class, he, a friend of his was teaching about wood turning, and he was like, oh, this is really interesting. And he bought a really small lathe, and then he got hooked. And he started buying bigger and bigger and bigger, and he's got, his shop has four, I think, um, of various sizes. Uh, but I also got an opportunity to talk to his daughter, who does some of the wood burning on the stuff that he produces and is an artist in her own right, and met her daughter, who is a soda student. Um, I also got to meet his wife, who's an artist in her own right doing w wood carving instead of wood turning. Um, so it's an opportunity to connect with the people um, that are part of my community who I otherwise wouldn't meet. I, I don't know that walking down the street, I would say, I mean, I might smile and say hi to Roy, our wood turner, but I wouldn't know anything else about his life, right? But I can appreciate the work that he does, how beautiful it is, and when people come in and ask about the woodworking, who's, who's your wood turner? I can tell them a story that makes them connect with a piece they otherwise may well, well, it's really pretty, but, right? But, oh, so he's a veteran. Oh, I can relate to that. I'm a veteran, right? Or I know somebody in my family who's a veteran. Oh, how'd he get started? Oh, this was just a hobby, and now he's doing it. He turns a piece a day because that's what he does now, right? So I think it's also about just connecting and, and realizing that the neighbor next door um, has, has a value of, aside from just being a person who's living in a house next to yours. You get to know them, you learn their name, you learn their story, and that's when we start talking to people, we want to tell our story, right? What's interesting about us? Most people do. Um, I'm not going to say everybody, it's kind of a stereotypical statement, but, or a broad statement. Um, but we want, we're curious, we are curious people, right? Uh, so if you can connect with an item or connect with a person in a way that feels absent, I mean, aside from, how many people are like, know their coworkers, but not their neighbors? A fair amount, right? You know the people you work with every day, but not the people that live next door to you, right? So it's, it's about making connections, it's about building relationships. 